Hi, hello, and welcome to another episode of The Dunker Spot. We are part of 342 Productions. I am your host, Nikaias Duncan, and joining me as always is my co-host, Steve Jones Jr. Steve, how are you doing, sir? Uh Ah, feeling good, feeling great. Happy to be here, excited to be here. Thank you, Dunkers, for once again embracing your bounce. Uh, Dunker Nation, let's ride YouTube. Hi. Hit that like button. Go ahead and comment down below. It's going to be a fun episode. Nikias, things are heating up. Everything's getting done between the lines, baby. It's time to hoop it up. It is indeed time to hoop it up, and all we can hope for is that the uh, the lines are even. But fun show, as Steve said, for us today. Going to look at the Western Conference playoff picture and play-in picture. Our biggest questions, as you know, it is April uh, recording on April 1st, but it's going to be April 2nd by the time you hear this. But we're hitting April, which means we're a couple of weeks away from playoff slash play in things. So just our biggest question marks for each team in the race as we head into this final stretch. Steve, let's have some fun. We will start with the Oklahoma City Thunder, who, as of recording, Monday afternoon, 52 and 22, top seed in the West. They are, per cleaning the glass, fourth in offense, seventh in defense, second in net rating. If you filter just for the post All Star break stretch, they are 15 and five since the break. Sixth in offense, eighth in defense, fifth in net rating. With the Thunder, who are obviously very good, fun to watch, etc. My eyes kind of go to Chet Holmgren right now. Oh, uh oh, who is also good. So yeah, I don't have any beef with Chet or anything like that. But conceptually as we dig into what are teams going to try to do or what are teams going to try to take away from the thunder once we hit a playoff setting chet becomes very important he's been important to what okc has done all year long the rim protection defensively the rebounding though it can be better but just having a literal big guy back there to help jump shoot uh jump start some of their transition possessions is important and offensively his work as a screener his work as a pick and pop threat his work as a pick and roll threat his work as a driver when spaced all of that has been massively important. I kind of worry about him being spaced in a playoff setting. Maybe worry's too strong, but like my biggest question with the Thunder is what does it look like when he's spaced in a playoff setting? We've talked about the drives for Chet Holmgren throughout the year and how the handle looked more refined from when we saw it post all, uh, you know, after Summer League, how much it was hitting earlier in the season. Teams kind of adjusted, sending high help, the high digs kind of bothered the handle. The drives became less effective. He seemed to counter that counter and look more comfortable. We've naturally kept eyes on what he's been able to do as a shooter. Again, a very valuable pick and pop threat, particularly above the break. He set no flat screens for Shea or Jalen Williams or whoever. Post All-Star break, he is shooting 30% on above the break threes. That was at 42% pre-All-Star break. On direct closeouts, just coming from second spectrum, so you catch the ball against a swing, Catch and drive, catch and shoot, catch and pass. 1.1 points per possession pre-All-Star break. That is down to 0.97 post-All-Star break. And then defensively, it's less can Chet defend on the perimeter because I think he slides well enough, particularly for his position. But if teams do space their bigs above the break, whether they're actual shooters or they're just going to use them as a handoff hub or something like that, if Chet is spaced high, what does his help look like at the rim when he is spaced high? And conversely, if he's not defending the rim, there's a massive difference in size and who's challenging these shots if you're able to break like that first layer of OKC's defense. So I guess my question to you is like, how have you felt about Chet on the perimeter on both ends? And what's your confidence level heading into the postseason? I would say, and I, I like how your question was just Chet Holmgren as a whole. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's, that's intriguing. I would say the three-point shooting thing raises an eyebrow. But what I would say is, has it changed how OKC plays? Has it changed who they are as a team? And that's that's, that's where I tie back in with OKC, and I say this is a team that knows who they are. They play together. They play their style of play. It's hard to shake them out of that as far as the spacing goes, as far as the cutting goes, the driving angles, uh, being able to clear wings and make sure that you keep pressure on the defense. So, yeah, 26.7% shooting from three in March, not ideal. But I also wonder how much of that is, A, him in a slump, and B, him just being a help point by default Mm -hmm. to where if we're going to really try and lock in on Shea, if we're going to try and also lock in on Jalen Williams, who is knocking down pull-ups and getting drives, 
if we're going to try and be a team that helps and recovers consistently against their style of play, does he now have to just be someone we live with as opposed to someone we close out strong to or we don't help off of as much? Is that just going to be the natural shift? So now we can feel better about these multiple efforts that we have to make. So I don't necessarily know if I point at Chet and say this is his fault. Uh, it may just be poor timing. You know, obviously you want to play well at the right time, but it may just also be this is this is our response. We've thrown different things at, at, at your team. We've thrown different things in you, at you in the half court. We have to get to a point where we feel good helping off two and a half people that are out here. And if we can do that in the starting lineup, Chet probably ends up being in that half. That makes sense. And to be clear, like, I, again, this isn't me saying Chet is a bad player, a flawed player, anything like that. It's to your point. Like, it's respect to what the Thunder have built overall and ultimately what Shea and now Jalen Williams have been able to do as creators to where we have to stop your drives. We know team-wide, y'all want to drive, get us in rotation, kick, drive again, shoot from there, all that good stuff. But if we're just identifying the game plan, we need to make sure Shea isn't comfortable. We have to show bodies. And we have to make sure that Jalen isn't comfortable, too. And that, by virtue, just leaves Lou Dort, you're going to get open threes. Josh Giddy, when you're in, you're going to get open threes. Chet Holmgren, if we're not just flat out switching against you, you're going to have to take and make these shots, which I guess lends it to like a secondary question with him because the percentages are easy to look at. It's good when you shoot over 40% on above the break threes. It is bad when you're at 30%. It is bad when you shoot 27% from three in a month. Like, duh. One thing that has popped up with Chet this year, throughout the season, even when he was shooting well, you will get to these pockets of the game to where pick and pop with Chet, two to whoever's handling the ball. Here's the catch for Chet. Hesitation. Doesn't want to take it. He's taken four already. He doesn't want to take that fifth one. Or he's taken five already. He doesn't want to take that sixth one. In light of the we're going to live with you taking these shots, how have you felt about his aggression above the break? Well, the, that, the thing he can't do is not be aggressive. That's where the impact of the misses will be even bigger than just missing. You know, you go one for six, you went one for six. But we feel good about the looks we got. If if it becomes now a record scratch moment for the OKC offense on a team that's really heav- heavily invested on flow, and now um, him and pick and roll or pick and pop becomes something the defense can recover to, or him space getting a drive and kick becomes something where, okay, we can recover and, and guard this closeout a little differently, that's where it becomes probably a problem. And that's where something you want to avoid if you're okay seeing the playoffs. But I think the tricky part is my question for you was how much do you trust this defense in a playoff setting? And I, I, for me, this is a, this is a good defense. It's an active Oklahoma city defense, a lot of size, a lot of length, a lot of activity. They really work uh, and, and help each other. They depend on help and rotations. I think we've seen that activity be a huge plus for them in the regular season when they're just flying around. You see multiple bodies in the paint on drives. Is that going to hurt them in a playoff series? Are teams going to be able to make them pay for those rotations knowing it's coming over the course of a seven game series? We know what you want to take away here. Can we flip that against you? You know, I like the zones that they have in their back pocket, which should help them continue to disrupt your rhythm. But can we now exploit that? In this matchup. One that's a good and it's a fair question. And it's something that I feel like you've been hinting at throughout like the last couple of years when we talked about OKC's defense. Like even before they made this leap this year, I was very eyes are wide open. Like, holy crap, look at this defense without a traditional rim protector. They're flying around. It's been good post all-star break, all that good stuff. And you would nudge like, hey, this is good. But this is a lot of activity. This is a lot of moving around. These are, these are a lot of moving pieces. And we get to this year, as you said, and as I've said, this has been a good defense all year long. They've been the top 10 all year long. They're seventh on the year per clean the glass. Post-All-Star break, they've been eighth. This is a team that I've enjoyed the way that they trap and double team in particular. If you're going to be small, you have to make that speed work for you. And the way that they do that is with, you know, they'll throw out the occasional full court press. You've mentioned the zone and how funky it can be. But ultimately, it really shines through when they do double the post they're generally very good at it. I guess for me, it becomes more of a matchup deal because I think this is a part of who they are. Like even on drives, like they are an aggressive, we'll sink way off this corner to make sure that you don't get anything in the paint and we'll give up corner threes if necessary. 
I do wonder what that looks like against the team that has a quote unquote bad offense. Like if we do end up getting and the Lakers have been really, uh, you know, we'll use the Lakers as an example. They have been one of the best offenses in the league post all star break. But on the season, like the offense has been pretty hit or miss. What do those double teams look like against the Lakers in a series? And now you're giving them two on the ball when they generally don't get that. Like, I guess that's where I get more concerned. And I say that as someone that if that's the series, like I would still pick the Thunder to win. I think they're a better team. I'll be clear on that front. But in terms of what can open up and does this become more difficult for OKC? If they do put two on the ball, the Lakers are able to make them pay with shots from the perimeter. And in general, they just have to work a lot harder when they already have, when they're already at a disadvantage size wise. Yeah. Like I think that, I think that's worth looking into. I think it's worth at least raising the brow if you're not going to press the red button. Like, though, this team is flawed beyond repair or anything like that. Um, I am in a good place with OKC's defense overall. Like, when they've been this good with this large of a sample. And again, even going back to the last couple of years to where you can see them building the foundation of it when they weren't ready to compete yet. I think there's just enough trust and enough continuity within the system that I don't think they're going to get blasted by a team. Uh, but it's worth keeping an eye on for sure. Uh, what what is your confidence level with their defense right now? Uh, but it's not in a bad place. Like this is not a hey, they're going to fall apart in the playoffs. So my mind just goes to those scenarios, especially when you talk about the matchups potentially with the Lakers. They're built on we have pressure points. We're going to make you react and play out of it. And you go back to even like when they played Memphis. Once we find the thing that you're going to do, we can now exploit that. And you're handing a guy like LeBron James an exploit, or let's say Phoenix falls to the play and they end up playing them. You have to deal with KD and Devin Booker in different ways. And so you have the combination of, hey, these guys can get it going, but also we can play out of what you do as a counter. And that's where my mind goes to, well, what would that look like in that series? Would that be something that hurts them? Um, adding right quickly to your chat point, as far as concern level, the fact that they set so many guard guard screens. Also, it's one of those scenarios where I'm like, well, they can just pivot to something else. I think that's something OKC is underrated at is their ability to adjust prematurely to a degree where Matt da- mm-hmm. Mark, <laughs> Mark Dadnault sees something that a coach is trying to do and gets all excited and squinty and decides, well, all right, we've got a game. <laughs> let's 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 try this now. Uh, how about this guard guard flat screen with, a, with an empty wing? Would you like to switch that? Interesting. We'll continue to drive. <laughs> uh, so that's where I'm like, I, it's not necessarily where it has to be Chet and pick and roll, or it has to be Chet in this specific action. It leans back to their system. Got you. And then just to quickly put a bow on the double team point, just looking at post ups and the percentage of post ups that they double, uh, they double on roughly 22 percent of those per second spectrum. That is the third highest mark in the league. The San Antonio Spurs at 26 percent and the Pelicans at 22.4 percent would round out your top two there. Um, can I toss out a very quick secondary Thunder question? Sure, man. Before we move to the next squad. What what is their best lineup to you right now? What is their best lineup? Yeah. Like I think in general, the beauty of the Thunder is they, they can just cycle through a whole bunch of different options as the fifth, but which which team, which lineup do you like the most right now? Mm, even though the impact hasn't been the same, I'm still a huge fan of uh Shea, Jalen Williams, Chet Holmgren. Lou Dort, Gordon Hayward. Okay. I, I like the upside of that five. That that uh, okay. five man lineup. Quick, got you. Just wanted to get the quick temperature check there. Um, let's move to the Denver Nuggets, who, as of recording, are 52 and 23, a half game back of OKC right now. They're seventh in offense, tenth in defense, and fourth in net rating on the year per cleaning the glass. Post All Star break, the Nuggets are 16 and four, second in offense, fifth in defense. Second in net rating. I think outside of the obvious like health and fatigue, as we get to the end of the run, like we've seen Jamal been out a couple, like there's been conversations about, hey, is it worth just resting these guys and Denver settles into two or three versus pushing for the one seed? So aside from like that stuff, I guess my my two biggest things, like they're kind of tied together. Mm-hmm. Like one, just a general temperature check on the bench, since that's kind of been the actual storyline to follow with this team in terms of if they're better or not. Mm. Because we know what they're we know what they can do ceiling wise. They just want a title. Um, so just a general how are we feeling about their bench unit right now? And then kind of tied to that. Michael Porter Jr. has been on an absolute heater post All-Star break. 
but he's been on the heater in a very Michael Porter Jr. way for the most part. Like he's just knocking down a bunch of jumpers. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I will toss out, how do you feel about (laughs) the Nuggets shot creation outside of Jokic and Murray in general? I, I guess it depends on what you define by shot creation because of the type of shots that offense can generate especially with how they've been humming this season post-All-Star break and the positions they put you in defensively and the ways they force you to sustain effort. And even if the Michael Porter Jr. shots feel like Michael Porter Jr. shots, they're very timely in the sense that Mm -hmm. this is a bonus to a degree. You know, look at when Contavious Caldwell-Pope has those days where he's flying off handoffs, stopping and popping for threes. Those are important shots. Would you, in a coach's meeting, like to go in and be like, hey, we'd love to give those up? Yes. The problem is they're going to get to those within the flow of their offense on top of everything else they do. And that's where it gets tough with Denver because they're such a moving target because, one, as soon as you feel like you figure something out, they move to something else. Two, if you do figure something out, you're probably in a tough spot either way as far as the recovery goes to where, oh, yeah, that's Jokic. Oh, yeah, that's Jamal Murray. Okay, we defended that. Oh, no, now they've gone to a random post split or handoff, and now we must do this all over again. So that's where my confidence in those two goes. Now, could it become a shot-making deal where, hey, they just have stopped making shots for 10 days? Sure, Mm -hmm. but I think that's the tough part about poking holes at this Denver unit right now because of the way that they have treated this regular season, you know? And uh, when it comes to the bench, the bench gets a little tricky because I don't think we know what what ace coach Mike Malone has up his sleeve as far as what's going to be the thing that copy and paste to aid the bench unit. I think we I think we've seen positive contributions from from Christian Brown. I think we've seen Peyton Watson show that he can help. I think those guys have shown flashes of what they could do to help in the playoffs. And the positive for Denver is we do have a formula to a degree. We know exactly what we need off the bench. So does it now morph into Aaron Gordon at the five with that unit? And now, well, we just need X, Y, and Z next to Jamal Murray and insert starter. That changes it a little bit. And you also have the benefit of whoever's playing with the bench is likely going to get a few minutes with Jokic before they go into the hashtag bench lineup. Get a little rhythm, huh? (laughs) So that's where I'm like, I'm not totally as concerned and in theory if Denver's humming and Jokic is on the bench those are very important minutes for the other team so even if it's a struggle fest right how many times is it really going to be like a 10-2 run against that unit not super often especially once we get into playoff Michael Malone in which if it is a 4-2 run, you might get a timeout. And he's like, no, absolutely <laughs> not. We are not doing this. So I, I definitely feel you on that point. And, and I had a tough time trying to find a question for this Denver team. Not that they're unbeatable. You know, you know, I'd love to be like, hey, is it is it just get after Jamal Murray? But how, how does one get after Jamal Murray? You want to put size and length on him? That's That's great. Do you have size and length all over the court? Oh, you don't. Guess what's going to happen? The person who's not very tall is going to be involved in an early screening action and now is guarding Jamal Murray. And guess what? <laughs> you are in the same deal. You didn't fall for that? Well, guess what? Here's Nikola Jokic. How do you want to guard that one? <laughs> also, if your size and length on Jamal Murray can't navigate screens, get ready to learn rescreen, buddy. Good job fighting over that first one. Do it again. Yeah. That, and then if you actually do that, here's a pass and cut. Get ready to do that too. Like it's been like we've talked about Denver and Minnesota matching up with each other quite a bit over the last year or so. Like that's kind of the fun for me watching Jaden once he gets to Jamal Murray matchup. Cause like in a vacuum, Jane's one of the best perimeter defenders in in the business, can navigate screens way better than a guy with his dimension should be able to do that. But it's just like the cat and mouse game. All right, I fought over this one. I get caught up on the second one. Oh, snap, I got caught up on the first one. Here's this review contest. Wait, now Jamal's trying to snake, and now this turns into a late switch. Or you try to get Jokic on the late switch, uh, or you try to get somebody on the late switch, and now it's a problem. Now it's Jokic having to battle with Jaden McDaniels on the block. Like, have fun with that. So that's just been fun. Um, well, I was going to say, just but, to add real quick, if I had to guess they're eight, 
I'd probably say Reggie, Peyton Watson, Christian Brown. Yeah, that's that's probably fair. And I think that's where with this being as experimental of a second unit season this has been for Coach Michael Malone, this is where it really stinks that Julian Stralter got hurt. Because I think he could have been a guy that added a different layer to that second unit so it's not just Reggie Cook in pick and roll or ISO. Or if Jamal Murray's with a unit, Jamal, you cook in pick and roll or ISO. You have some legitimate off-ball stuff that you could flow into with Julian Stralter that they've experimented with since he's been back. And like even looking at this recent stretch without Jamal, like them tinkering with Jokic plus here's four bench guys, no Reggie Jackson, just no point guard on the floor and saying, okay, what can we create with this unit? What does this look like? Um, so like that's been interesting to me. And circling back to the earlier MPJ, Kentavious uh, Caldwell point, Kentavious uh, Caldwell Pope point. There we go. I can speak. Like, you're right. Like, they are such good shooters and they make such timely baskets. Like, you don't feel good about trying to funnel shots at them anyway. But I guess for me, like, the basis of the question was, one, the Nuggets as a whole, they want to win inside the arc. Jamal Murray can get to floaters and pull-ups whenever he wants to. Jokic can knock down literally anything inside the arc. Punish it, you know, uh, touch the paint with his post touches and stuff like that. Outside of those two, it feels like the Aaron Gordon lobs when he's in the dunker spot or the random seals when he has just a legitimate smaller person on him. Like, that's kind of the source of rim pressure for them. Mm. And that's where, and you look at the Nuggets, like, this isn't a high-volume three-point shooting team at all. And that's where I'm just like, hey, it is cool that MPJ can knock down these shots. And ultimately, again, they just won a title, so I'm not, there's no need for me to get too heavy-handed on it. The formula can work and has worked. But that's where I just kind of wish, as cool as the KCP come off the empty side handoff, flowing to an elbow jumper, as cool as that is, the duel for MBJ as well, it would be nice if one of those two had a little bit more juice to where they could take two or three dribbles and genuinely puncture the paint and get shots for themselves or just keep the chain moving. Because it does feel like it's kind of wholly on like those three, really those two. And then Gordon just kind of cleans up in some way. Can I ask you a question that's going to annoy you? Sure. Do you really want those guys over-penetrating? I mean, like, if the base is over-penetrating, no. <laughs> but I'm just saying, that I wish they were, like, comfortable, comfortable, like, uh, act, you know, getting 2D paint as a driver. Oh, so driving some closeouts. I understand. That, that's totally fair. Yeah, so that's all. That's totally fair. And I mean, it's just, look, man, it's you think you got one thing going? Here comes inverted pick and roll. Well, we haven't gotten to the elbow action with Jokic, Murray, and Gordon. The fact that they know where your help points are going, that's great. Now, this brought me uh, to a, another point or a question I had for you. Okay. Is the bit to find a hole in their defense? Now, stick with me. This is not okay. rehashing Denver Nuggets can't play defense top because we have seen them play defense. Put Jokic in the pickle no, roll. No, 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 no. We are not doing that here. You will not do that to me. But the, here's the theory. Like KCP has been fantastic. Aaron Gordon always there. Jokic has improved defensively. As a team, they defend. They've gotten better. They rotate. They get after it. They've shown a level of versatility with Jokic at the level and a drop, guarding a wing or a non-shooter. And again, top 10 defense this year. Is the key to score on them so you can set your defense and hope for the best. Is that just the bit? That's kind of the... I mean, yeah, because like there is, as we talked about on the Old Man, the three things with JJ, Like there is no good answer to how you defend Jokic. And that's before getting into, okay, well, we can't really defend Jokic. How do we defend Jokic plus Murray? Okay, how do we defend Jokic plus Murray plus Gordon? Okay, how do we defend Jokic plus Murray plus Gordon plus MPJ? Oh, KCP just fills gaps. So, like, there's no easy or right answer to defending them. I do think, especially if you are getting Jokic at the level, your best bet is to manipulate that to the degree that you can. As quietly good as Jamal Murray is as being, like, a low man within, like, guards, he's one of the better guards at being able to be in on time and challenge at the rim and stuff like that. Like, make Murray your low man. If you have enough secondary shot creation or ball handling, make KCP your low man. If you're going to get Jokic at the level, 
Like, I think that's going to be your best. But you have to manipulate that coverage as best as you can to get those openings in the half court. And then from there, like, if yoga is off the floor, like, that is, as you alluded to earlier, like, those are your minutes to win. Like, the formula for beating the Nuggets in a vacuum, I think, is you make sure you hold the Nuggets to, like, plus three or worse, and then you just hammer the non-Jokic minutes. Aha, get ready to learn switch, buddy. (laughs) (laughs) Correct. Hey, all that stuff you're all running? Cool, we're switching everything. Good luck. Which also, you're not wrong. And again, Denver's really good defensively. But in the back of my brain, I'm thinking, could this be a much more difficult path for them as far as the offenses they may have to face. I mean, that with no disrespect to anyone from last year. But in theory, you know, seeding is a mess. It's a mess. So we don't know. They could be one through three. It, it, it's a whole mess. Let's say they end up with Phoenix in the first round. I still think Phoenix with that kind of shot making is a challenge for Denver. Just because either you're going to have to say we're in a drop and we're living with these. Or are you going to put two on the ball and that's going to open up Phoenix to generate good looks? That's just tough. Mm-hmm. Say that's the first round matchup. Say you're the one seed, they fall to eight. La la la. Then you get a Clipper or Dallas in the second round. We saw what Luca and, and Dallas did to them. We're like, hey, you, you have to defend me. I, I'm Luca. Mm-hmm. You have to defend me. We'll figure out the, the other end. Is that going to be rougher for them? Overall, having to sustain defense in different ways on the way to the finals. It, it's like yes and no. Like yes in that the path would absolutely be tougher. Their defense will be tested in both of those matchups, presuming reasonable help for both teams. If, that's, if that ends up being the 1-8 and then the 1-4 one, or 1-5. One, it also, I feel like, would bode well for them. Because ultimately, even if that's the path, like I would pick Denver to beat Phoenix in the series. And I would pick Denver to beat Dallas in the series. Though Dallas is making me really think about that one with the way that they played as of late. And Dallas did just beat Denver not too long ago. But like I would pick Denver in both of those series as of April 1st. No April Fool's joke. If you get that kind of test with your defense in your first two rounds, and let's say you end up facing Boston in the finals, like it's pretty cool to get those kind of reps early on and then face this Boston group. You're not wrong, but you, you could just end up with a Thunder group that plays completely differently than the two teams you conquered. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that is very true. That is very true. So that, that, that's just where my mind is. There's, there's, there's different templates at play here that Denver will have to deal with. Not that they can't. They've shown that they can and they will, but it's just it's in the back of my head as a question. Like, hey, mm-hmm. you know, you're ready, you're ready to play defense. Here comes Zion. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Welcome to the Western Conference, am I right? Good I was grasping for straws. Denver's very good. I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> like, I feel like with Denver and with Denver and with Boston, it's just kind of like, I have questions, but I feel like it's the same question. How can I repackage this? Or do I really just get like super granular with something that pokes out? But even then, like, does that matter in the grander scheme of things? It's funny. These teams are really good. Um, Let's go to Minnesota. Third seed in the West right now. Half a game back of Denver. They are 16th in offense. First in defense, third in net rating. Post All Star break, they are 12 and 7, 17th in offense, fourth in defense, ninth in net rating. And we'll quickly note since March 5th, which is the day after Carl Anthony Towns was lost, they are 8 and 4, 15th in offense, 5th in defense, 10th in net rating during that stretch. Steve, I hate to be boring, but my primary question with this Minnesota group outside of is Cat coming back? How does he fit back in if he does come back? How are we feeling about Minnesota's late game offense and Anthony Edwards' decision making late in games? I I feel I feel fine. These these have been really good reps for him, and the growth that he's shown as far as being able to know when two on the ball is coming, being able to see where they're trying to send help when he's isolated or in drives or in post ups, the fact that he's getting more attention is a positive to a degree for a Minnesota team that can at times bog down and struggle to get teams in rotation. So I think that's a plus. Now, you, you're you going to have to live with some of the shots that he takes because you need some of those shots that he takes. I think on the plus, are we more worried about the late game offense or are we more worried about their offense in general in a playoff setting 
assuming Cat is not able to come back, in which a team has really game planned you and is now funneling shots. Like it's not. I mean, they have help points, but now we're funneling shots and decisions this way, um, or we're we're more comfortable throwing switches out, so Mike Conley can't attack that drop and engage the defense and mix in the floater and the pull up and the lob for Rudy. Hey, that's a switch now. We're staying at home. Hey, that's a switch now. And now it's two on the ball and in. Is that the curveball that teams are going to send towards Minnesota to say, hey, yes, the offense may be X, Y, Z. Yes, you guys look good when you move the ball side to side. You have shot makers. You have versatility. Um, you know who you are, which is a positive. Can we now disrupt that further? Mm-hmm. Which, which would you be more concerned with? Um. I would say probably just the lock-in factor in a playoff setting with this offense right now. I think it's, I don't want to say it's easy because it's just not easy losing 23, 8, and 5 or whatever Cat is averaging this year and that kind of talent. But within the flow of regular season games, some teams are coming in on back-to-back, some teams are missing guys, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you have this kind of foundation as a defense overall. Like, you can churn out some wins, but that doesn't mean, oh, we're they're 8 and 4 in the stretch. That doesn't mean they're going to win three rounds in the West because they've been winning so far. Um, so I guess just the general lock-in factor that teams could have with their offense would be a bigger concern. Um, but then just very quickly on the numbers front, like I brought up the late game offense in particular, the Wolves are five and six in clutch games post all-star break. They have a 91.9 offensive rating in the clutch post all-star break, which is 29th. Uh, do you know who is last? The Wizards? No, but it is a team that we've talked about. The Hornets? Recently, I should clarify. No. The Magic? It is indeed the Orlando Magic. Oh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> this is what it is. And then as you brought up the switching point, something that I've been keeping track of all year, is, hey, what does this Minnesota team do against switches? And we talked about them super early in the year on JJ's show. They're like, tw- I think they were dead last. Then they moved up 23rd. And they moved up 21st. They are 15th right now. Do you know who's 14th? Uh, barely percentage points ahead of them. I do not. The Los Angeles Clippers. Ah. Which is just a very funny thing to consider. But just wanted to throw that in there. But yeah, like I think, and something that you pointed out is like the process is starting to feel a little bit better about what they're getting into offensively. But it's, a you know, naturally it's different in a postseason setting. So I would like to see that process continue and if they can get the shot making to go along with it. Because in general, Ant can make big shots. Mike Conley is not afraid of the moment. Nas Reed certainly not afraid of the moment. If you do miss shots, you have Rudy on the offensive glass. Like Kyle Anderson can get you in the spots if he's your closing option, which actually that takes me into like a secondary question that I had for you. If you're assuming that it's Mike Conley, Anthony Edwards, Jaden McDaniels, Rudy Gobert, late in game, they have the optionality, which I think is an overall positive, but who do you feel better about as the fifth right now? Is that Nas Reed? Is that Kyle Anderson? Is that Nikhil Alexander-Walker? Or is that someone else that I haven't named? I think it depends. You're not going to like that answer. It's going to sound very coachy. <laughs> I understand. I'm sorry. I am who I am, and I cannot change. I mean, I can evolve, but, you know, to the core. Yeah. It's situational, though. If Nas Reed has a cooking, then if, if there's a defensive issue or anything, we can live with it because Nas Reed has a cooking. That's very important on the other end of the floor. If we need that ball pressure and that activity, hey, Nikhil Alexander-Walker, come on down we know you can help us on the other end. If we're in a position where we need defense on a a person of a certain size, Kyle Anderson has a lot more value. So I think the optionality, honestly, is probably more valuable for Minnesota than the preference of having, hey, this is our closing group. Because, you Mm -hmm. you know, to go through and win in the playoffs, you're going to have to have a level of versatility. You're going to have to be able to find your way and navigate against through different series. And, you know, if we're talking about a conference finals run, there could be, in theory, one where Nas is a difference maker, one where Nas Reed is a difference maker, one where Kyle Anderson's a difference maker. In theory. Mm-hmm. At, at the very least, they can be able to shuffle the deck a little bit. Yeah. No, that's fair. And you are 100% right. Like, I think the optionality is more important than option A or option B or option C. Uh, I guess to answer my own question, like, I think with the, it's honestly just a, uh, just a pathway to me to compliment Nas Reed. Because one, like his defense has just improved so much from last year, in my opinion. And the fact that he's been able to hold up as well defensively, even in this stretch without Cat, like I, I probably feel better with him being in that closing unit. 
which, you know, ties into the switch point that you made. If teams do feel more comfortable switching against Minnesota late in the games, Nas is going to give you another option to, okay, we'll just give it to him and let him drive against someone if that's a bigger player or if it's a smaller guy, we can just put it up, give it to you on the block and you can have some fun in a way that Nas has not down threes. I, I still just kind of worry, does that dry up in the playoffs? Because I don't want it to. And again, it's not like teams are terrified of him on the perimeter yet. And then with Kyle Anderson, the ball just kind of has to be in his hands to get like peak offensive value from him, which isn't a bad thing. You can run things through him in the elbow, you know, and stuff like that. So like, it's not a inherently a bad thing, but if you're able to get, just throw out some numbers, if you're able to get 75% of the Kyle Anderson defense from Nas and then also get not just a scoring punch, but the ways that you can use him on and off the ball and open things up late in games. So you don't just have static pick and roll with Ant. He sees two and now what are we doing? Or he sees a switch and now what shot are we getting? I think I'm higher on Nas in this closing lineup right now. That's fair. Uh, We have talked about how good the Minnesota Timberwolves defense is. Very active. Very good at, you know, uh, containing penetration, helping each other as a team. Do you have any playoff concerns for the Timberwolves defense? Um... Not big ones, no. Okay. I will say, like, just the general things that I keep an eye on, like, when Ant is off the ball, how engaged is he going to be? If he, keep, you know, continue to keep an eye on that. Uh, Mike Conley, as good as he's been, like, he is just virtually the smallest guy on the floor. So what happens if you are just putting him in action a bunch? Rudy has been better in space this year. It's something that you've talked about extensively. Does that go backwards? Or if Rudy is in foul trouble, what does the defense look like? So, like, I have just the what does this look like type beat, but I don't have you can hammer Minnesota here, and this is the red flag, and this is how they can be a first-round exit. I don't have that right now. That's fair. Can I ask you a Rudy Gobert question? Sure. One Rudy Gobert ghost of postseason pass pops back up. I'm going to let you choose. Okay. Teams decide to switch against Rudy so his roles don't have the same impact. Or some of Rudy's issues defending in space pop back up. For this Minnesota team, which one could they live with? I I think it's the switches in five. I think the defensive foundation is super important to what they do. And ultimately, since Rudy has done such a better job of consistently sealing against smaller players when he does get those switches, he doesn't always get the ball. But at least you get that. And if a shot does go up post switch, because he's done his work early with those seals, he now has more of an opportunity to get those offensive rebounds and get Minnesota extra cracks at it. I'm fine with dealing with that versus the space stuff pops back up. Especially in light of some of the things I'm keeping an eye on with Minnesota's defense as a whole. Like if the space stuff pops up with Rudy and also Ant is losing guys off the ball, he's staring at the ball. Or, you know, if, if Nas goes back to the defense and stuff like that, and now Rudy just can't recover because he has his own demons in space. Like, I, they can't, the defense cannot go backwards with Minnesota. They can ugly it up and get a 92-88 victory with Ant knocking down some big shots on like an 8 of 19 night or something like that. If the defense goes from best in the league to like 8th in the league, I, I don't like their playoff ceiling Mm-mm. in that case. Okay. Okay, I, I like I like to talk. It's all this talk, and we're just going to circle back to this. So, hey, is is Jaden McDaniels just the X factor? <sighs> yeah, we can talk about that some other time. I just, you know, <laughs> please hit, please hit shots. Please do not foul. Take the jumpers in rhythm. I, you know, I, I love Jaden McDaniels. One of my favorite players to watch in the league. I just, you know, quick decisions, brother. We we need that. Um, to the Clippers. Who, as of recording, 47 and 27, four games back of Minnesota. They are third in offense. They are 15th in defense, seventh in net rating. Post All Star break, though, 11 and 10, eighth in offense, 29th in defense, and 18th in net rating. You know what I have in my notes first? Uh, I'm not sure, but I know you have some heat in here. So I'm, I'm awaiting your question. Not even heat. Like the literal first thing I have written in my notes is, uh, will the real Clippers please stand up? Ah, because like none of this matters if they're just not going to be engaged on both ends for at, at least 40 of the 48 minutes. Ah, this just isn't going to matter, like, especially if the, if the four or five is Clippers, Dallas, 
and the transition defense doesn't clean up, which, I mean, Dallas doesn't run a ton, but they do run more than they have in previous years. If the transition defense is going to be bad and they're just going to walk the ball up the floor on offense and kind of slog into pick and rolls and stuff, then Dallas is just advancing. That That is just going to be the bit. So first and foremost, can we just get engaged Clippers? Okay. It's going to be the postseason, so I imagine they do. So that's off the board. Beyond that, though, and I'm sure you will laugh, but which version of James Harden are we going to get? Ha, uh, ha, uh, Is he able? <laughs> <laughs> Post All-Star break, 15 points a game, 40% from the field, 31.5% from three on seven attempts. Not getting to the rim as much, as much as both of us applauded the defense during even during the early goings when they weren't winning yet, like he was putting in legitimate effort on defense. And then they had the, what, 27-5 and five stretch when they were just the best team in the West during that run, if not the best team in the league altogether. James Harden was legitimately playing above average defense. Switches were fine. He was on time, weak side. That has gone backwards. It cannot be both with James Harden. Will we get, fully, will we get that version of engaged James Harden on defense? And ultimately, will he be able to hit at least two of the levels offensively? I don't think the playmaking is going anywhere. Can he find the three ball? And can he at least get to like the comfortable floater? If it's not going to be like 25 or 30% of his shots coming at the rim. Can he at least get the secondary layers going offensively? If so, and in general, if he's just able to get the Clippers into their offense with a little bit more tempo, I feel much better about this group overall. So that's kind of my, that would be my big picture question with the Clippers outside of like obvious health stuff. I got you. Uh, so we have done this podcast for three years now? A little over three years. Yeah. How many years has that been the question, Nick, guys? Uh, at least two of them. <laughs> Will James Harden get to the rim? Yeah. Um, I, I think for me, uh, especially in that Orlando game where they tried to attack him down the stretch, took the switch, contained one-on-one, had active hands. I think the recipe is there for what he needs to do when he's put in action. And yeah, he absolutely can do it. He's shown it this year. And how much, again, it's, it's all about just staying out of the liability zone. You just need to do it well enough to where we don't want to do that anymore, or we're not going to do that anymore. Now, how different does the Clippers defense look in the playoffs when Kawhi might be a little more willing to take some of these matchups earlier to a degree, or be more involved with some of these matchups earlier to a degree, or Paul George may have, more activity with some of these matchups earlier to a degree. Does that change the math for them defensively? I think for me, the Clippers just have, can they find it? Can they refine themselves? We've seen great half court actions. We've seen incredibly slow tempo. We've seen getting stops in, in transition and then not converting on the other end. We've seen that perk up. We've seen the good, the bad, the ugly, the in between. My question to you, and I'll flip it back because I anticipate you might go this route. <laughs> You do a pod with someone for so long. Yeah. Who's more important to have going in a playoff series? James Harden or Paul George? And I ask this because in the Clippers wins, Paul George shooting 49% from the field, 45% from three. And the Clippers losses, 42% from the field, 34% from three. Funny enough, I anticipated you would have a Paul George question. (laughs) (laughs) So I think, honestly, the answer is kind of both, which is a very boring answer. But I say that because as the offense has shifted so much more to James Harden, you are running this and getting guys in their spots. In a way, like James is going to have to get Paul going to a degree. Like there's going to be at least a little bit of emphasis to make sure, hey, you get some of these early pin downs. We know Kawhi can ISO and post up whenever he wants to. Or Kawhi can just run some of this offense whenever. But if it's not going to be a free-flowing thing and they're going to play, you know, like legitimately fast, not just, you know, regular tempo with their offense in the half court, then like James is going to have to prioritize getting Paul going and getting Paul going to the rim. Some of these pin downs need to become curls. Let's get him, let's get him downhill a little bit. Let's get him to the free throw line. Let's get him in the rhythm early. Because to your point, when Paul George is on, this team looks entirely different. And when he's off, or if he's not involved, Paul George can float. Because he is, I think, naturally fine with, I will space, and then attack when I get it. He's not going to, and I don't mean this is like a personal derogative or anything like that, but like he's not going to be a guy, hard clap, give me the ball, I'm going to, these are my next four possessions. He's not that guy, unless he has it going. To that point, they just defer to him anyway, because he's got it going. 
And so with the offense structure the way it is, like, it, I think it is more important for Paul to get going. Especially once you factor in, like, what he does on the other end as well. Like, you want that two-way impact. But it ties in together. Like, I think there has to be an emphasis to, all right, Paul, you do your thing. Because ultimately, you can kind of lean on Harden plus bench lineups if you want to get him some shots. If Paul is out of rhythm and you try to go Paul plus bench, it's not going to, it likely won't hit the way that you want it to. So I, I would lean Paul on that front. I'm going to ask you a real quick question. Who's their best five to you right now? Aha. Uh-huh. You, know, you know what I have in my notes? Uh, beyond that, what's their best lineup right now? Or ask the Dunner way. Has Terrence Mann done enough to solidify himself as the fifth? So uh, glad we're on the same page here. Um, in terms of their best lineup, like I think it's the big three plus Norm Powell plus honestly, I probably lean Zoo. Okay. Which I would like for him to get to like the first two and a half months of the season level defense. Okay. Versus what we've seen as of late. But I think in general, like Zoo has been better in pick and roll. He's still not perfect as a short roll decision maker, just in terms of like the pacing of it and stuff like that. But, like, he has gotten better at that aspect. And then defensively, he is still a good rim protector. He helps them with the rebounding and allows them to get into some of the selective transition pushes that they do get. So that would probably be, I think that's their best five. Like, I would imagine, like, the lineup data probably disagrees with me on that front. But at least I feel better about that five. I think that's fair. I I, I think it gets, uh, I'm really in the mindset of, okay, who is the fifth for their best lineup? Uh, mm-hmm. I think them settling in on the big situation helps them. Having Russell Westbrook back helps them. Uh, being able to trust Amir Coffee a little bit more helps them to a degree to where we still have size length. We still have a little bit of optionality if we need to mix and match. It's just going to be, hey, can Zoo hold up on his end of the bargain defensively? Not that he's bad, but it can get matchup dependent at times. Mm-hmm. When do you want to go small? How do you want to go small? And what do you run when you go small? And then what do some of the bench rotations look like? You know, are you adding minutes? Are you boosting things? How does that kind of formulate? I just wonder if this is a team where the playoffs are going to help them as far as regaining some of what they lost on this journey to where they were one of those teams that were in that clump at number one. And they just kind of been, Mm -hmm. hey, you're number four. Hey, wait, you might be number five. Actually, you're number four. (laughs) But even then, though, what, the Mavericks were two games back? Mavs and Pellies are two games back. So, I mean, it, it could get hazy. Could. Could. But, yeah, to your point. Also, just very uh, quickly related before we move to the next team. As you were talking about their fifth, like Russ is now back. And so, you know, you've talked about Amir Coffee and some of the other guys. How do you feel about the Kawhi at the five lineups? I think we talked about the Clippers going small as a concept. But, like, when they do go super small, you have Kawhi as your center. And it's legitimately four or smalls beyond, you know, alongside him. But do you like those lineups? I'm fine with it. It's just who's who's going to be the fifth person? What are you going to live with? Mm. Who's James guarding? What are you running offensively? Are you ready for the help point? Is this, is this a way to try and get Russ going on one end? I, I, I think it's something that is going to – they're going to have success with it at some point. And, I, and honestly, the fact they haven't had to lean on it is probably a plus. Got you. Okay. Just wanted to take the championship there. Let's move now to the Dallas Mavericks, who, as of recording, are 45 and 29. As mentioned, they are two games back of the Clippers. They are sixth in offense, 19th in defense, 10th in net rating per cleaning the glass. Post All Star break, the Mavericks are 13 and six, one of the best records in the league. Third in offense, 17th in defense, eighth in net rating. For the Mavericks, one, I'll ask you like a, a narrative E question right now. Are they the most dangerous lower seed uh, in the league right now? To, you know, just take out the home seeds, one through four on both conferences. Are, is it just Dallas? Mm, I think there's a there, there's there's Dallas because Luca, there's Phoenix because of KD, there's the Heat as a concept, <laughs> there's the Sixers with Joel and B returning, and then LeBron and Steph. Would I rank them at the top of that list, depending on the day? Depending on what Kevin Durant says that day. But I would say, yeah. 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 They're, look, look, this has been, like, the wins are great, but this has been a very statement week. Just a, a mm-hmm. quick reminder on what you're dealing with. 
hey, Sacramento, these are some big games. We're going to come in and win both of them. You don't want to put Sabonis on the big? That's fantastic. You want to put him on P.J. Washington? That's great. Guess who's the screener now? P.J. Washington. P.J. Washington. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, would you like to navigate that? Oh, you, you, you don't want to switch? You want to put two on the ball? Here's a pop. You want to switch? Okay, cool. Here's a Luka step back. You want to just contain? Okay, we'll just play out of that. Hey, oh, hey, Daniel Gafford. We really appreciate your roles. You're kind of good at passing out of them now, too. This is great for our team. Two thumbs up. Hey, Houston. You guys have been humming. You guys can switch everything, huh? I'm Luka Doncic. Hey, Jalen Green, come over here, bud. Let's have a chat. <laughs> actually, actually. Dude. Hey, Fred Van Vliet. Hey, hey, come on. Come over here, pal. Hey, Jock Landell. Let's come, come hang out with your boy, man. Hey, Jabari. Hey, Reggie Bullock. You gotta, you gotta pay attention to Luca because when he knows a team is switching everything, you know most teams they will attack a specific matchup, maybe one or two, to a degree. Size limitations, depending on how they feel about it. I don't want to be hyperbolic, but Luca don't care sometimes. <laughs> he hitting everybody. He just, hey, no, whatever. You, let's give you a try. You, you can, you can get some of this. And it's just like, okay, well, now what do we do? And my mind goes to a playoff setting. Schematically, he has the ability to put you in a position where you don't feel comfortable with any of those options. And that's before you get to the whole, hey, Kyrie Irving, kind of cooking. And now you get into a scenario where, hey, we want to put two on the ball against Kyrie. Do you? (laughs) What does that open up if you do that? Hey, we want to switch against Kyrie. Do you? What does that open up? So that's where... They're starting to get that understanding. They have the group that they feel better about on both ends. It's where the defense feels better. And now, in a playoff context, how much fun is this team truly going to be to deal with? Um, it's going to be fun for us to watch. It is not going to be any semblance of fun to deal with, especially if uh, Luke is going to cook like this and if Kyrie is going to make the shots that he's making. And if you're getting this kind of productivity from the bigs, it, it is... It's so weird. Like, even reading their defensive numbers, like, 17th of the year, 19th post to break or whatever, it was flipped. And it's just like, yeah, like, it's not great, but also, like, that's kind of the range that they needed to be in to make this work. Because you have Luka, and you also have Kyrie. You just need the defense to not be a tire fire, and you cool. And then <laughs> with this group in particular, there is such a collective size and length that they have. That even if they don't have the A-plus defender, or Honestly, they may not even have the B-plus defender right now. Then you just point to say, this guy could be a stopper. Like, I think Derek Lively is going to end up just being the super scheme, versatile, B-plus and everything guy. But at the end of the day, like, Lively has length and range to him. Gafford, like, I have my defensive questions, but, like, there's at least an element of size there and some rim protection. P.J. Washington, he's big, and you're comfortable switching him onto people. Derrick Jones Jr., long and lanky. Like, they can just, they can shrink the floor and switch a whole bunch of stuff and, like, show help behind it. And it's like, even if these guys aren't scary defenders, we don't have as much space as we want to navigate. And they can kind of shape your shot profile in a way because of that. And then on the other end, you got to deal with Luka and Kyrie, which brings me to my question, unless you want to jump no, in. You, I, I saw your eyes like mm-hmm. Okay. Which kind of brings it to my question with them. It's very open-ended, but can Kyrie and Luka continue to grow their chemistry together? Because we know how talented they are individually, and we know like there is a basic level of Luka can run this. If for some reason it doesn't work, we can now swing it to Kyrie on the opposite wing, and now he can cook and run something, and that's dangerous enough. But this is something that I cited last year. With Luka screening for Kyrie or Kyrie screening for Luka on ball, 54 reps all of last year. That's obviously skewed by like some of the injuries and them shutting it down at the end of the year and stuff. So low volume, but 54 all last year. They've run 87 pick and rolls together post All-Star break. And like the numbers haven't been great on that front, but you know, even speaking to your, the matchup hunting point, like they are fine going double drag or just double pick and roll. Kyrie is your first or your second screener to feed Luka a matchup. And good luck if you botch that and it's now two on Luka and now Kyrie is slipping into space. Stop and pop, drive. He can make the next pass from there. It just feels like, again, I was looking at those numbers on second spectrum, like the actual pick and roll numbers between those two. Either way, they are not good right now. Post all-star break. Under a point per possession. But conceptually, they look more comfortable doing things together. 
And when the baseline is half-hearted screen from one of them, here's the matchup that the ball handler wants and they can cook and that's his efficient offense. When they can legitimately be used together and crack your defense that way, it's just another layer to what they can do to you. And if they score enough, they can set that half-court defense. And again, this is where the collective length and the switchability can kind of can really hit for them in a way, particularly in the playoff series. So I, I, I want to see like how they continue to build the boat on the actions that they use in tandem. You know, you bring up the pick and roll point and you bring up the waves point, both excellent hat tips by you. I think some of the movement stuff has been fun with Luca and Kyrie to where we're hitting the elbow. Kyrie's coming off a of flare or we don't have anything. We hit the big Kyrie comes and sets a split for Luca and, and just being able to use them together in those kind of ways. I think mm-hmm. as much as we want or we imagine the success of the pick and roll between them, being able to play together in waves and understand how to play off each other and making it more sudden for the defense feels more important come playoff time. Uh, more than anything else. There we go. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts or secondary questions on Dallas before we move? I mean, you hit the defense point that I had, the question I had. I mean, once you get past Kyrie, who's their next smallest person? Is it Tim Hardaway Jr.? Like, like I think in a literal sense, it's probably Josh Green. I, th- I think Tim Hardaway, I have to look it up to verify, but I think Tim Hardaway Jr. is like technically taller, bulkier than Josh Green right now. But like naturally, Green's a better defender. So like you would pick on Tim before you pick on Josh. Um, but yeah, I think that's it. Man, yeah, that's just it's size. Mm-hmm. Like, even if it's bad, like that is size. Like there's only there's finite space that you can navigate, even in today's NBA. So I'm intrigued with these Mavericks, man. Uh next to the New Orleans Pelicans, currently in sixth, 45 and 29. They have the same record as the Dallas Mavericks, but Mavericks have a tiebreaker right now. But the Pelicans on the year, 12th in offense, 6th in defense, 6th in net rating. Post All-Star break, they are 12 and 7. 13th in offense, third in defense, fourth in net rating. For this Pelicans group, my question goes right back to the front court, which, you know, the obvious health aside, we get Brandon Ingram back, can Zion stay healthy, et cetera, et cetera. We know that's going to be a good question that swirls around. Beyond that, though, recent stretch for Larry Nance Jr. has been pretty darn fun. And even in the games that it hasn't been fun, it's been notable that Willie Green has been like, hey, it's the third quarter. JV, I appreciate you, big dog. How about you come sit next to me? And we're going to go a little smaller and a little switchier. Has Larry Nance Jr. done enough for you to solidify himself as the closing five? As the closing five or in the closing five? In theory, yes. But again, I, I probably prefer that they have the optionality to go between them. I guess the question becomes, which version of Larry Nance are we getting? We're getting the one who's strong on defense, can execute multiple coverages, not afraid to mix and to make, keeping the ball moving, screening, rolling, making passes that way. Or are we getting the theory of Larry Nance where, hey, we want to make sure we can do X, Y, and Z, so you're going to play. And that's where I think the, the big rotation gets interesting for New Orleans in the playoffs. Uh, is that the version that struggles to rebound and has our dear friend Jeremy in a headlock? Uh, yeah, probably, probably that one. Gotcha. But I mean, that's probably the one we hadn't seen. Now he's been he's been a huge part of what New Orleans has done turnaround wise. I want to make sure I say that. But <laughs> you know, that's that's where it can get interesting because do you do you end up doing the same things you will with JV with Larry Nance, and does it how does it pay off on each end of the floor, and does that become tricky based on the matchup? Like it's it's gonna be interesting to see how they treat Phoenix during this stretch. Down the stretch. Mm-hmm. And plus, you you need you need JV, honestly. Especially some of the, the offense stuff, the flow stuff. When he's able to hammer home some post-ups, you still need him engaged, so you don't want to tap the button too far. Yeah. They, those, those post-ups can hit. And the way to use like, as they go into every team runs some variation of Chicago action, but, like, as they go into that, like, JV's a big body that does a really good job of freeing CJ if he's the one coming off for Brandon Ingram, when he's healthy, he's coming off. Or when they do it for Zion out of a sideline, out of bounds, if they pitch it into him on the inbound. Like, he's important. Even with the Zion JV pick and rolls that they will set inside the arc. That's a big buy to navigate. And now Zion has a dribble and he's launching into your chest. He's an important part of what they do. Can I ask a secondary question? Yeah, what's up? 
I don't know if I've tossed this to you before in like a watch party or something. How do you feel about Trey Murphy's defense? Uh, does his job. Does his job. Can't get a little ambitious on the weak side, but does his job. Okay, see, the weak side portion is where I'm just like, hey, man. It, their help is very important to their base. And, like, similar to, you know, the Denver question, like, can you find a hole to poke it with their defense? And it kind of blends into an overall, can you just score against this group? Like, there's a lot of focus on, like, what JV does within their defense. Like, I've been, you know, during this Pelican stretch period over the last couple of years, like, I've been someone that's raised the, hey, what is the scheme versatility with JV questions? Like, I'm not saying I'm not part of that. But, like, I do see Trey on the weak side sometimes. It's like, hey, man, you kind of, if you're not going to be wing stopper, because that's not your portion, at least not right now, you at least have to be solid off the ball. And, like, there are enough to where I'm just like, hey, can you put JV in action to make sure... Trey is your low man and you just get skips? Well, here's here's the thing. It's all nuance with this scheme. Mm-hmm. As, as some may have put together a great 17 minutes about the Pelicans defense. <laughs> <laughs> Even in, within those clips, you saw the activity, you saw the rotations, you saw the help, you saw openings. Mm-hmm. And that becomes very tricky in a playoff series. To where, hey, if you nail the rotations, you get it. And hey, maybe you want this person to shoot. I get it. But if they start making you pay, and because we're in a playoff series, we're not just going to take the automatic shot. We're going to drive and make you guys rotate again and now play out of it. Do you open yourself up that way? So it's it's less the Pelicans defense isn't good. It's now what do you do in the playoffs? What it was, mm-hmm. Zion has been working his tail off during the stretch defensively. A lot more activity. He's shown some hedges. He's shown some switches. It's been fantastic. Is the team going to look at him and say, come over here for a whole series? Is the team going to try and put CJ in action? You know, are they going to put Herb in action and, and rely on trying to beat the weak side? So he's not a part of that weak side rotation. How do you kind of navigate those little tweaks that a team may throw at you in that setting? Uh, probably be where my head goes. I got you. Like, I asked about Trey because, like, one, like, some of the weak side stuff is just kind of loud with him. And, again, that's the basis of the scheme and the nuance within it. And he's a young player that's also missed a bunch of time this year. So like, those are just reps that he's missed. The other part, uh, shooting 39% from three in wins, 32% from three in losses, and has the worst net rating on the team in losses. Like, he feels like a pretty important bellwether toward his Pelicans group, which is what makes him so exciting. But when it doesn't hit, it can get problematic on either end of the floor. And so that's more so thinking. Like, I'm ultimately, I'm pro Trey. Like, he's very good. But as we get into a playoff lens, like, hey, some of these young fun players, are they going to be the guys that get poked at a little bit? All right. As we've gotten through the playoff teams and we are pretty deep in the pod, let's go through the West play in teams and then we will get to the Eastern Conference on our later in the week episode. Audio only uh, that will be released Thursday or Friday, depending on your time zone. So if you want to check out some East thoughts, we will have you covered on Thursday slash Friday. Let's get into the play in, Steve. Very quickly, we will start with the seventh ranked uh, Sacramento Kings. They are 43 and 31 as of now. They are 13th in offense, 20th in defense, 19th in net rating per clean in the glass. Post All Star break, they're 12 and 8. 10th in offense, 13th in defense, 14th in net rating. Though Kevin Herter, gone. Malik Monk, likely gone for the rest of the season. My question is a simple one like, who steps up in the perimeter room with Kevin Herter and Malik Monk out? Uh, the short answer has been Keon Ellis for sure. Mm. Uh, I think he's shown an ability to defend and be able to make defenses pay. Very interestingly enough, I'm keeping an eye on Keegan Murray and to see what this does for him during this stretch. Not that he, you know, has played poorly. They've leaned on him with more defensive matchups. There may be more of an opportunity for him to be used in, you know, some of their pet sets and pet actions. How does he respond to this stretch? Uh, do we see more Harrison Barnes? Do we see more guard line? It's just going to be interesting. It's just tough. You know, losing Herder is one thing. No Malik Monk is another thing. And now it's like, okay, do you have another, another, th- yeah. another level that you can hit? Because he was so important to not just the fabric of that team, but some of the corrections or steps they tried to make to get ready for this part of the year. And now you mm-hmm. just don't have that anymore. So now does it just become, hey, 
we need to lean on, on more defense, which really hasn't been our identity. Or, you know, Davion Mitchell, it's your time. Chris Duarte, it's your time. De'Aaron Fox, you got more room. Like, that's that's where it gets tricky. It's a plus that you, you've you run things the way you've run them. Uh, but now, who's going to who's gonna sync it up? Is it, is it going to be Vinzikov? Come on down. Let's get some shot making. I don't, I don't know that portion. Um, but if, if you're going to get Keegan at a different level, you're going to get Fox, you're going to get DeMontis Sabonis, who, uh, just won't stop getting double doubles. Uh, one of four players since the 80 81 season to have 70 or more double doubles in the season, joining a list with KG, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Moses Malone. Seems good. Yeah. Yeah. Does this, is this going to, is this going to put them in a position where, hey, we have to defend? And offensively, we we have to keep moving. We we, we got to keep moving our bodies and try and generate the best shots that we can. Does that in turn help them? Very, very, very weird to say. Does that help them shape some sort of identity down the stretch here? Or is this just one of those all man type deals? Yeah. Like, I think the Keegan usage is going to be interesting. And I think it's going to be interesting on both ends. Because normally you talk usage, you think about how do you being used offensively. But in light of him taking on more defensive responsibility, like, can he continue to do that while also having to scale him up both on and off the ball offensively because you are now missing Malik Monk and missing Kevin Herter? I'm curious to see what it's going to look like. Like, Keanu Wells has shot well from deep as he's been since he's been in the rotation. That hasn't been enough to bend defenses yet. They're still very much okay with him taking those shots. And as you mentioned, Davion, like, he can also bring a blend of point of attack defense he can get to the rim with the ball in his hands. He's willing to take shots from the perimeter, but how are defenses actually going to treat him? I think that's a fair question to ask. Um, I would say just quickly looking this up on cleaning the glass. Uh, with Kevin Herter and Malik Monk off the floor, the Kings are slightly positive, a plus 1.8 net rating in 980 possessions right now. Uh, the Fox, Ellis, Murray, Barnes, and Sabonis lineup has a plus 6.3 net rating in 293 possessions. And then replacing Keon Ellis with Chris Duarte, another name that you mentioned, a plus 1.6 net rating um, in 265 possessions. Though the offense in both of those units are a little bit subpar, 116 offensive rating with Keon, a 114 with Chris Duarte. The defense is very good, though. So in terms of just shaping a new identity on the fly, and something that you've talked about throughout the year, either here, watch parties on your own personal timeline, the Kings have been trying to find stuff defensively. They, they have been prepping for the playoffs. And defensively in particular, they, they have done different things with Sabonis. They have experimented with its own like they've been trying to find different things so they can be more equipped in a playoff setting. And so if you are removing Malik Monk, Kevin Herter, obviously important offensively, you are able to add a little bit more defensively with the guys that you're replacing them with. Like if that helps them balance out the defense more, there's still a pathway for them to be successful. It's just going to be more difficult for them to do so. Um, so we'll see what's going to happen on that front. Then the only other question that I had was just with the Aaron Fox, as it's been a good year for him overall, but it's been a bit uneven. Can he find the right jumper slash drive balance? It's been important for him to establish the pull-up jumper as a counter, both inside and outside of the arc. But, you know, rim pressure is all, you know, rim pressure is down. Like the drives themselves aren't down from last year, but rim pressure overall has been down as he's experimented more with the jumper. Can he run, find the right blend there, especially in light of them not having the movement shooting elements around him? Um, that's the only other question I had there on Sacramento. Did you have anything else that was uh, circulating uh, the brain? Well, I will say one, the one plus, I know it, it hasn't been a bunch of games without Leap Monk. He did get to the line 10 times against Utah. So I guess that would be something I would be keeping an eye on. Does does this perk up the aggression to where, hey, I need to do X, Y, and Z a little bit more? Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's Sacramento's type of team where it's like, hey, they I feel like they really needed six. Even with Monk, without Monk, I felt they really needed six. This isn't the end of the days, but that play-in, not the most fun, Nikaias. Because you know who's right behind them? Uh, The team we're about to talk about next, the Phoenix Suns. Uh, Also 43 and 31. Ninth in offense, 13th in defense, ninth in net rating on the year. Post All-Star break, though, they are 10 and 9. 12th in offense, 15th in defense, 17th in net rating. The question that I have in my notes is, what the heck is this team, man? What is their identity? Ah, what is their identity? It's a good question. 
Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I don't know if they have one. I don't know if they have one. I've been missing. What's their what's their defensive identity? What do they do every night defensively? Offensively, what do they do outside of we have these three really good players? What? But to this day, Nikias, I didn't mean to cut you off. I know you had another good question. Oh, no, you're good. I wanted to get this off because I don't know what to do with the Phoenix Suns. I don't know what to do with the Phoenix Suns because we have these questions every single time about their offense. Do they have enough movement? Are they relying too much on pick and roll? What are the lineups looking like? What's their identity? Defensively, it's this, but could it be better? Are they active? Are they taking anything away? And then you see them play the Denver Nuggets. And you see the type of shots they generate. And you see them double team and rotate and commit to that defensively. And that seems like things that would be a positive in a playoff context. And no matter what you think of the Phoenix Suns, I can't let go of the idea that you don't want to see them in the playoffs because you don't want to see them in the playoffs. You just don't. We can be honest. You want to sign up for this version of Kevin Durant? Not really. They're very, they have a very talented top three. Or if you're more pessimistic, a very talented top 2.5, depending on which version of Bradley Bill you get, which kind of circles into like a secondary question that I had. Like, I guess in general, how have you felt about his on ball usage this year? It's felt a little weird. Yeah. It feels weird, right? I see it. Like, skill set wise, it's very easy to see how he would slide in on and off the ball. But then again, well, one, just naturally, he's just been out a bunch. And so as they're trying to find stuff and find lineup connectivity and chemistry and stuff, then he misses games or Booker misses games. And then it just kind of restarts the process. So like, that's the biggest reason why it feels kind of wonky. But then when they do have all three of them together, it just feels like they oscillate between, hey, this is a whole lot of Bradley Bill and like him and Nurk are doing the thing with like handoffs and cutting or they're doing pick and roll stuff or Bradley Bill is standing in weak side corner. And that is just the, that is just it. And I'm just, as I watch Suns games, like there has to be some sort of middle ground to where you can use Bill in a multitude of ways, but in general, you can use him more without it feeling like it is the Bradley Bill show featuring Devin Booker and Kevin Durant. Like it kind of feels like it's the injury stuff first, but beyond that, it kind of feels like Frank Vogel doesn't want to fall into the bucket of trying to integrate Bradley Bill to the degree that it limits what uh, KD and Booker do. And it, I find too often it ends up going the other way to where it's like you have Bradley Beal. He's a valuable spacer, but he can do more for you. Like pre all-star break, 11.4 drives per game. That feels low. Post all-star break, 14.5 drives per game. That's a bump, but that still feels low. And like, even if he's not their best driver, he kind of feels like their most important driver. And if you can shift more on-ball usage to him, like, there is value to getting KD and Devin Booker off the ball, both as spacers, but also, hey, we can run KD off of something now. We can run Devin Booker off of something now. And Bradley Bill can get the ball to them because he's a solid passer. And then if not, Bill can drive and then kick to those guys, and then they can play against the tilted defense. He's been around 17 picks uh, on-ball picks for 100 possessions all year long. That's low. You didn't trade what you traded and strapped yourself financially for Bradley Bill to get for that to be his portion. But again, he's a clear, very clearly the third option. So it's not a one to one comparison. But like you look at Luca, he's running 50, 60 pick and rolls for 100 possession. Bradley Bill is not going to reach that because, duh, it shouldn't be a third of that number. In an ideal case, in an ideal world, like I feel like there's there's some sort of middle ground to be found with Bill. I wonder how much of that ties into just the overall imbalance with the Suns offensively to where they run some really incredible off-ball movement actions and then stop. And so does Beal end up being on the other end of that where, okay, we didn't run this, now I'm spaced, or I'm ball handling. And that's just kind of the in-between. Or I'm being used as part of this movement to really open this up. You know what I mean? Like, that's where it's like, I, I don't, I don't know. I think the best version of them is when you have the wave. Because again, skill set wise, Bill can be on and off the ball, can be used as a screener. Have fun. Devin Booker on and off the ball can be used as a screener. Have fun. Kevin Durant can be used on and off the ball as a screener. Have fun. I want them to get to that. 
Because like, the defense, as I've asked about their lineups for KD at the five, what does that mean for the rebounding with the base unit? I've had like nerd questions heading into the year and stuff like that. The defense has done the job. When we did our season previews, it's like, hey, this offense should be incredible if healthy. They just need the defense to be like 17th or 18th. It can't be awful. If they're average or better, then cool. They're 13th. They are flirting with a top 10 defense. That part has been done. They, the offense should feel better than it does. So I don't know. Very impassioned for the eighth seeded Phoenix Suns, but it is what it is. Uh, did you have any closing Suns thoughts? No, that's, 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 that's about where I'm at. It'll, it'll be fun to dive in to see what it looks like if they make another push, if they're in the play in. But yeah, that's, that's where I'm at. Um, Lakers, Warriors, are you moved? <laughs> I said, let's just wrap those two together. Uh, am I moved? I I want to be like one because I brought up the Warriors on a recent episode, and it was kind of around like you know the Steph minutes thing, and then just lineup stuff or whatever. And I just didn't discuss the fact that Steph is averaging twenty three points a game post All Star break. Like one, because I just have baked in my head. Like I know he was in a slump, but like it's it's going to turn around, so I'm not like super worried. But it is at least worth saying that the shooting has dropped off, the finishing has dropped off. Like this has been like in a prolonged stretch of him being sub Steph, not necessarily bad, but sub Steph. And so the biggest question is how quickly does that flip? Because if it does, then the ceiling raises because he's the best player on the team. He's one of the best players in the league still. He bends defenses in a way that not many in NBA history ever have. So, like, the primary question for me is, when does Steph just start back hitting 44% of his threes again? And what does that open up? Um, but to the mood portion, like, really not until that happens. And also when I know that their starting center is going to be their starting center for, like, five games in a row. Mm. So that would be cool. Mm. Um, and then someone else to pop um, on the bench unit. It's got to be my thing. And then with the Lakers... Offense feels better. Threes are being made. D'Angelo Russell's been very good. Austin Reeves looks more comfortable. LeBron James is hitting threes. Anthony Davis has been incredible on both ends of the floor. Rui in the start lineup has obviously been a good thing. It's kind of helped balance some of their rotation stuff. Um, I need the defense to be better than what it's been, though. In what sense? Well, just all, all, all faces, like 20-second post-All-Star break is just not going to get it done for this group. <laughs> so we could <laughs> so we'll throw that one quickly as we're not doing like the full Laker dive but I think the biggest thing is just going to be like uh, dribble penetration that's kind of the biggest thing for me they got to be able to keep the ball in front because it's a lot of strain on Anthony Davis that's fair that's fair I, I, I think what moves me Rui's play and then uh, Le- LeBron James right 25 8-7 53% from the field 41% from three Seems good, but he had 40 yesterday. Yeah. 40 and five assists. Nine of 10 from three. You want to sign up for that? Do you, 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 you want to see that in the playoffs? Uh, as a fan, absolutely. Uh, as a team, having to game plan for this Laker group, that is a uh, fifth in offense post All Star break. No. So, I mean, I, I guess for me, it's just, okay, what would the, what would the matchups be? It's very interesting, jockeying-wise, you know? Because mm-hmm. if you're Phoenix, there might be a belief, hey, you know what, we'll take Denver, that's fine. If you're the Lakers and the Warriors, you know what? Mm, uh, probably not so much. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay with that. I am sure that the uh, the Lakers would like to avenge themselves. I don't know if that would go particularly well for them. I think Denver's just better, but I'm sure they would want that matchup. And then we're not going to get to talk about them, but 11th in the in the West right now, the Houston Rockets, who just had their 11-game winning streak snapped by the Dallas Mavericks. So now the Mavericks, uh, winners of seven straight, have the longest win, active win streak in the NBA right now. Just a salute. They did all of that. And they are now, what, two games back of Golden State now? Uh, All it takes is a weekend. Yeah. Now it's kind of it's just kind of tough. At Minnesota, 
uh, Tuesday against Golden State. Thursday, Miami Friday at Dallas Sunday, Orlando Tuesday. This is it. Dang, dog. Ahem, this ain't Texas. It's kind of it's kind of tough. Uh, a shout out to the Rockets, 14 to 6 post all star break, 11th in offense, 7th in defense. And that's after Luca did all of the things yesterday, including a scooped long two over Jabari Smith Jr. Unfortunate. And with that, as uh, Steve did not like the joke, thank you for watching or listening to this episode of The Dunker Spot. If you haven't already, please subscribe to us. We are on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever you get your podcast, you can find us. And again, we are doing the Eastern Conference version of this on the next episode. So we record on Thursday. They'll be released Thursday night or Friday morning, depending on your time zone. So be prepared for that. You can follow me on Twitter at NakaiasNBA. You can follow Steve on Twitter at Steve Jones 20 Join us in the Dunker Spot community on Twitter. We're having fun there. If you have a League Pass account and you would like to watch basketball games with us or just hang with us, you can do so via Watch Playback. Free to set up your profile. Very easy to do. And from there, put in your League Pass information. You can watch games on screen with us. Real-time analysis. We're breaking things down during timeouts. Answering basketball questions throughout the night. If you have fourth quarter or overtime antics, we're breaking down what went right or what went wrong with a play. Slow mo clips, all that good stuff. We have a lot of fun. And in general, it is a place to give your food takes, ask about relationship advice, uh, recommend TV shows or movies. We, we the room is it's a safe haven. A safe haven. It's a very funny place. It, it's it's hard to describe. You just got to be there. So, but the link to the room is hyperlinked in the podcast description. So again, if you have a lead pass subscription, that's all it takes. You don't have to enter in like credit card information or anything like that. No shenanigans. Set up your profile. You're good to go. And you can watch basketball with us and hang with us. We, we go live virtually every night. So if you want, if you want to add some color to your basketball watching experience, come rock with us. Also, if you are watching this on uh, JJ Ray's YouTube channel and you have not subscribed to JJ Ray's YouTube channel for some reason, go ahead and subscribe to JJ Ray's YouTube channel. We are here every Tuesday. That's the day after Monday, the day before Wednesday. But in general, lots of great content dropping throughout the week. So you want to be tapped in. And with that, we will catch y'all later in the week. I, I have two things. Uh, Dallas Mavericks guard Luka Doncic and Atlanta Hawks guard DeJounte Murray have been named the NBA Western and Eastern Conference Players of the Week, uh, respectfully, for week 23 of the 23-24 season. Shout out to DeJounte. Uh, shout out Luka. Shoot or shoot. That's what I'm talking about. Also, great show, Nakaya. So whose return are you more excited for, Jalen Johnson or Joel Embiid? <laughs>